think. The exemplar industry for things like social media, um, but this is a basically a copy of, in particular, the music industry. This is the model that the music industry has operated on in the 20th century, where you would have small labels producing music, and at any point where those labels become successful, they get swallowed up and acquired by a bigger um, company. So music industry stole what's like EMI and Sony, BMG, they basically would go around hoovering up smaller units in order to um, pick them up. And this process basically is the same as well. So you get large companies that buy smaller studios. The immediate thing that happens then is that the small studio gets put at the mercy of what we call market forces. The large company is entirely contingent on having a, you know, a balance sheet which they're in profit. Now, indie studios, to an extent, can get away with being run on a very small scale where profit and loss that isn't so important because the game itself is not going to cost as much and if they lose, the losses are going to be smaller. But when you're talking about a large company, you're talking about hundreds of millions going into the development of something, the losses on a hundred million scale are much more significant. So the scale of the financial impact becomes much larger. Financialization therefore becomes a control mechanism. You start controlling what the output is. You say, no, you can't do that edgy little game, or you can't do that cute little sort of um, you know, cult thing which you know, some people are going to really enjoy but other people aren't going to get. That's no good anymore. You need to do something which hundreds of millions of people are going to enjoy. You need to change what you're developing and the way that you're targeting people. So, at that point, we say that capital is driven in what's called a dual moment. On the one hand, you have lots of extra money to do cool things and to hire new people and to expand. But at exactly the same point that you do that, you become at risk because as soon as you start investing more money, you've got far more to lose. The, you know, the, the costs and the benefits match one another. Yeah, we've just been taken over by a big company. We've got a whole bunch of new money. We've got new studios, we've got new people working for us, we've got new tech, etc. Et and it's like, shit, we have invested all this money, we better make a hit or we are completely fucked. You know, that's basically how it works. What happens in terms of working practices there that you get surveillance of productivity. So instead of game designers being sort of rocking up at 10 in the morning, you know, having a couple of games of pool or whatever in the studio and taking it easy and, you know, everything's nice. And if you want a good example of this, it's a good um, sort of dramatized um, program on Netflix about the development of Spotify as a company, which it kind of tells this story. It's a different industry, obviously, but it actually exemplifies this in a really good way. But I can't remember what the name of the program is now. It's, and it's not an English language program either. It's a, it's a program in Swedish, um, but they dub it into English. It's pretty good. Um, Financialization equals uh, both self-surveillance and general surveillance of productivity. Instead of being happy-go-lucky, you know, get to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, leave at 7 o'clock at night, this is how much it needs to be done, everything needs to be done to this scale, this is the date the game's coming out, we're not sloppy anymore, everything needs to be done to this, because putting it out here makes that much money, putting it out here makes that much money, we're going to put it out there, etc, etc. So as soon as you get acquired, financialization kicks in, and then it becomes a control mechanism of the company itself. The result of that is precarity, which um, Bullock describes as the hegemonic form defining employability in any form of neoliberal industry, but in particular in the games industry. So, hegemonic, common sense, accepted as a norm. Neoliberal, the idea that you know um, profit comes before all other considerations, that market forces dominate everything, and things like workers' rights, etc., should not be considered. All media industries, precarity. Precarity dominates every form of media industry. More than any other industry, I think, the media industries and creative industries have embraced neoliberal precarity as the dominant form of doing things. 
It's really interesting. Um, Stephen, who did this module last year, emailed me last week saying she's got a job working for a local media company. That's great. That's really exciting. You know, great for her. But the one question I couldn't ask her was, can I see your contract? Because <laughs> that was what I really wanted to ask. Thrilled for her. It's really exciting. She's really excited about it. And I just really wanted to ask, can I have a look at that contract you signed? Because I know what it fucking says. It says you're going to work 37 and a half hours a week. And any other hours that are needed in order to get projects completed on time. I know that already. And it's a roller. I can guarantee it. Six month rolling contract. Over and over and over again. Until they bump to pay for three, four grades. This is awful. She might watch this. Um, <laughs> hopefully this doesn't happen. But you get bumped three, four pay grades and then it's like, mm, there's more graduates coming now. That's how things will kind of work, though, you know? So in game development, basically, this precarity is different to other precarious occupations. You know, there's a lot of precarious employment out there. A lot of people on zero-hour contracts, right? Where it's different here, we should have no sympathy at this point, because, you know, the world's smallest violin should be playing at this point. In game development, this precarity affects white, heterosexual, middle or upper class people. It's like, fuck them. I have got no sympathy whatsoever for these people, right? But I suppose, you know, I shouldn't be so nasty. Basically, the games development industry is a gig economy. And you may be familiar with the term the gig economy. You know, we usually contextualize the gig economy in terms of you know, people who work for Deliveroo or companies like that, you know, or Uber drivers. You know, the idea that you work you, you get paid for the work that you do. If you're not working, you don't get paid. The games industry works on a very similar model because financialization brings in this notion that you have to be flexible in terms of who you employ. Employing people full-time is expensive. You have to pay taxes. You have to pay them holiday pay and sick pay. Where you employ people on zero-hour contracts to do something in a limited amount of time, you can get around all that shit. It makes it cheaper. Brings your bottom line of costs down, so it improves the profit margin. You know? So instead of employing people on long-term contracts, you employ a bunch of people on short-term contracts to get something done in a limited amount of time. And then you control exactly what they do through algorithmic control of labor. You measure what they're doing. Working in a games studio is grim. It looks like a cool place to work, but you're being monitored all the time. The amount of work that you do, how long you spend at your workstation, what you do with your workstation is all quantified. And that's what they pay you on. So you know all that cool stuff, and it's like, it looks like, like Maria was saying, it looks like a really cool place to work, you know, you go and play hacky sack for a while, you ain't being paid for that. You know, that, that's, that's time where you're not. You, you get paid for the time you're on the clock, basically. But as you said, you know, there's a mythic aura of video games as improving health and education and so on. It's a cool thing to do. Um, and the actual reality of unemployment increasing tax returns is kind of blown away by all of this. Like, you know. So basically, the industry works in what we call a hybrid model. Yeah, it combines the model of television with new media economies. The whole, I'm talking about the industry as a whole here. Um, And what, why I say it combines these two things is um, companies would sell televisions in the past at cost. You know, it didn't because they would get you know manufacturers would get bump backs from networks to sell televisions cheaply, and tell them then the, company, the networks would compensate the companies for selling TVs cheap, so everyone's got a TV, and then the networks can make money on top of that. This was basically how the model worked. So weirdly, our TVs were more expensive in Britain than most other places because we have that kind of weird funding model for the BBC. So the BBC wasn't in a position to do that. But in America in particular, the big networks would pay television manufacturers to keep the prices artificially low so people would buy televisions. And then they could start making money on top of it. It was an easy win for the TV networks. They were making so much money. It didn't matter if they were paying off the company to make them to sell them. 
basically we see this model in the games industry as well. Consoles are sold far less than the actual cost of doing them. There's a really great example of this is um, Meta and the, the Quest headsets. They, I mean, I've got a Quest 3 in the office. It costs about 400 quid, something like that. Um, I don't pay for it, the university pay for it. Um, I've got another one in my house, which um, is <coughs> They don't know about that headset costs about a thousand quid in development costs. So undoubtedly, no way you can get that out for less than a thousand quid. What they're banking on is you're going to buy something that we control, and then all the games that you buy for it by taking fifty percent of that rent. So we're going to make our money back. Don't be worried. And this is basically how the games industry has worked for years. The consoles are actually fairly expensive to make, but we'll sell them less than that. Because once you've got it, you've got to buy games to us. You have to buy our products. And it doesn't matter if it's made by a different company in the game. We're taking a slice of that anyway. Because they have to pay us licensing to run on our consoles. So we're always taking a slice of everything. So they make their money in the games. This is how this is done. TV worked like this for years. And this principle as well. And digital distribution actually streamlines this. Because if... In the digital distribution model, you no longer have to put any capital into producing physical things, producing the cases, producing the manuals, producing the discs themselves, which actually don't cost very much to produce, but um, nonetheless, it's a cost. But most importantly, reducing the transport costs of everything. Shipping units around in order for people to buy them in places, put them in shops, etc. In the digital distribution model, we don't need any of that. So now we can say, oh hell, we're going to top slice all that shit. It's all profit now, you know. And um, games are becoming insanely profitable devices now. As the price is going up, one of the conceits of digital um, distribution was going to be the price of games was going to come down because they were going to take all those other costs out. You know, all the cost of distributing a game. That's not going to work. We don't need that anymore. So games are going to... And this is genuine stuff, you know, Sony and Microsoft and people will come out and say, this in the long term is going to reduce the cost of games for gamers. I say, fuck, they've gone up. No, the cynical amongst people like me always knew this was going to happen. But, you know, it's, why should, like, why is Spider-Man 2 the same cost as a digital download as it is in the shop? I know it costs more to put it in the shop. Why is it the same cost? It, how much is it costing... Sony for me to download it. Nothing. It don't cost anything for them to provide that to me. But yet it's still exactly the same price. Thieving bastards. Now, given all those things, the games industry itself, the bigger games industry, the console makers and all that, still need these AAA games to hit. Because they've hinged their business model on the games being the thing that generates money as well. So you've got game designers are financialized, they need big games. The games, why the games industry needs the big games, well, otherwise people ain't gonna buy the consoles, you, nothing's gonna happen. And then all our profits are contingent on people buying it, especially now through the digital sort of download thing, where they can actually take a bigger slice of people's game as well. So everyone's hinging on these games being hits. We're going to have 20, 30 games a year. They're going to make a shit ton of money. Don't worry about the rest. This is going to, this, the industry is going to be absolutely on this. So you've got a complete dominance of AA, of AAA games because of that. And what um, Bullard says is then you get what is called a logic of one-dimensional creativity. Take no risks whatsoever. Produce the same thing that you know is going to produce money. Make the same game over and over again. So basically, this is exactly what Adorno and Horkheimer were talking about. When I, I probably didn't talk about this in the first year because I wasn't there when you were doing this, but um, the Frankfurt School talked about standardization and pseudo-individualization. And this is the same principle going on in the, in the video game industry. You guarantee sales and you minimize risk and you have no experimentation going on whatsoever. And it's mad to me that we are still playing games with our hands. I don't know why that is. The technology is out there that says we don't need hand controllers anymore. We could be doing all sorts of weird shit with hand tracking technology. You know, we could have fully embodied game experiences 
No company is going to put money into that. Why? Because this shit makes money. Why invest all that money in a risky sort of thing instead of saying, yeah, fuck it. Keep people using hand controllers. It's fine. Keep giving Leighton like, a fucking repetitive strain disorder on his thumbs. Bastards. So we got FIFA. You. I'm, I haven't updated it because I don't like the graphics from the new one, to be honest with you. But that top up there is the original FIFA game. Um, now, obviously the graphics have improved a little bit, but actually, they're not that fucking different at the end of the day. It's the same game. They've just basically made incremental changes of it over time. That top FIFA game sucked. It was terrible. I paid, I bought it. I paid 35 quid for that in, 20, in 1993. That's probably about 100 quid now. There's something wrong with me. Um, I think blue. Um, I don't see that uh, FIFA 23 years much better, to be honest. Those, that comparison at the bottom is just insane. That's exactly, nobody can tell me that's not the same game. That is exactly the same fucking game. All this, the only thing that's changed there is Robert Lewandowski is now playing for a different club. And it's like, well, that's not, you, you can't get me to part with that sort of money for that, right? But this is the dominant logic of how things work. You make the same game over and over again because it's risk-free. And you don't want to take risks. When there's huge amounts of money involved, risk is a really bad idea. If you've got a sure thing, stick with the sure thing. But the structure of the industry itself says this is how it's got to be. Now, in terms of working in the industry, so Kylie Jarrett um, brings this up, that the playful nature of employment disguises large-term exploitation. People are basically exploited to do things, to work far greater hours than they're capable of, in terms of crunch working. The first time that this became a big media story was Red Dead Redemption 2 in 2018, when it was exposed that Rockstar had been getting um, workers to work 100 hour weeks to finish the game on time. From That game came out in October 2018, and basically from March 2018, I'm not talking about one or two people, but hundreds of people were basically working 100 plus hour weeks to get that game in shape. So you're talking about best part of six months of just working 100 hours a week, flat out. I mean, how people can do that, I don't know. You, I'd keel over and die halfway through that. That's far too much. I'm just surprised about like the psychophysic implications. Like, apart from mental health, like physically, eyes on the screen yeah. for so long. Like, how is that acceptable? Imagine what what it's doing to your body posture. You know, to, you know, we're not just talking about the psychological impact, the physical impact of doing 100 hours sat at a desk all week. Fuck me. You know, it's not exactly the healthiest way to live. I guarantee you those people are imbibing huge amounts of sugar to keep going, huge amounts of caffeine to keep going, huge amounts of nicotine to keep going. So, damn. <laughs> Heart attack central. Um, in a wider context, this not just away from the working practices a little bit, but back to the industry itself that refuses to innovate and is extremely conservative in what is made. But what you tend to get then is a cycle of white middle class men making games that reflect themselves over and over again because they have been successful. Um, and we see this exemplified in some of the bigger games. So. Um, the Anastasio, she did an actual um, ethnographic study in Riot Games. If you read that paper, it's hilarious. It's kind of, I, I want to say it's hilarious. It's not funny what she talks about, but she sort of went into Riot Games and observed the working practices of people in Riot Games, and it was just like, this is like a fucking frat house. It, this is just total gender discrimination, awful treatment of women, misogynistic comments, abound everywhere, total bro culture. And she's like, this is, this is awful. And they're not even toning it down. This is like an academic here, watching what's going on. And it's just like, holy shit, if this is, if this is the toned down version, what is it like? You know, it's really, really bad. Um, and because the dominant cultural logic in development is escapism, that reflects the sort of games that are made as well. You know, games are aimed towards 
pulling people out of real life in situations rather than you know, developing games as a medium which integrate more with the real world and provide us with new and interesting experiences. The cultural logic of things actually stays fixed in time. And then you get, I mean this is um, Bullock's sort of conclusion to all this, what he calls techno-masculinity. Not to be confused with sort of misogyny here, because that's not really the point that is being made. Techno-masculinity more refers to the idea that the working practices in the industry are modelled along this very masculine ideal of you work hard, you know, work should be your life, you know, be a man, basically, you know. So creative work assumes the white male is the universal subject whom the practices of programming concerned with. You see words like passion and love are euphemisms that operate as the infrastructure for techno-masculinist uh, ideology and practices. Techno-masculinity is the key to understanding the community of practice, where game workers think, work, uh, and imagine. It's gendered, exploitative, and precarious, and it is all around this idea that actually you shouldn't have a life. You shouldn't have family. You shouldn't have relationships. Work is everything. You work, you know, you're here to work. That is, and that's really what is meant by that sort of use of the term masculinity in that. So what are we dealing with? Industry is huge, toxic. Working practices are awful and precarious. Revenues are not reflected in the working patterns. Long hours, deeply gendered, techno masculinist sort of way of doing things. It's pretty shit. So, by show of hands, who's going to work in the games industry? I guess you all want to work in the games industry because it's fun. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Okay, let's talk about Simon Tula. I don't know why I used like, a Janet Lee and Psycho for this, but it seems fitting. Um, okay, let's have a look at this. Now, as I said at the beginning, but there were some people not here, um, I'm just going to go canvas here and show you what I've done for this. I might move the assignment information at the top of the page, so it's easier to find. I'll do that when I go back to the office. Um, and the assessment information folder at the bottom. Obviously, you've done assessment one now, so we can put that behind us. There's assessment two. I've got that open in another tab. And I've got three example um, assignments for you to have a look at from last year. All of them scored better than 70, so they should be good models for you to work off. They're three very different games. The reason why I've chosen them as ones for you to work off, they are three quite different types of games that are being chosen by. But they'll give you some idea of the structure I'm looking for. I haven't given you a lot to go on here. Uh, let me zoom this up a bit. Um, genuinely, there isn't much to go on. Simon 2, 50%. Two and a half thousand word critical essay. This will take the form of a critical review of a game of your choice. I get the fucking thing, I don't know. Um, but it cannot be the game you use for assessment one. The only criteria that I have to stipulate for the game that you choose is you can't do the same game. That's it. Um, it's not reflective. I don't want you to reflect on your own play practices in this talk. Write it in a formal academic style, but it is a review of the game in that. Please don't go down the IMG route of like giving it five stars or anything. I don't give a fuck about it. Like what you think the game is good or not. This is about using the academic material to conduct a critical analysis of any particular video game. Um, and I've just given some advice of you will need to look at it from several perspectives. Two and a half thousand word, several basically means three or four different perspectives that we've covered. So by perspectives, you can take the breakdown of each week and look at it and think what you know what these are. Maybe I want to talk about flow. Maybe I want to talk about narrative. Maybe I want to talk about the gender implications of it. Maybe I want to talk about violence. Maybe I want to talk about the industry perspective itself and how it makes money and so on. You know, these are all different ways that we can think about doing this. Maybe I want to talk about how it positions players, etc. Nearly always, people will choose these four topics: flow gender, 
violence business. Which is fine. That's, that's absolutely fine. You've got the material to do that. And so that's absolutely fine. And within it, yeah, pick something interesting. Don't pick something I don't fuck with. Somebody did something last year. I've never even heard of this game. I refuse to believe it actually existed. Yeah. Just, what the fuck are you talking about? In terms of structure, I mean, it's, a, it's an essay. What I would recommend you do is take the traditional essay structure. So in this, let's say I'm writing about three themes. And I'm going to have an introduction and conclusion, as I would traditionally have. I'd have my three themes. I would like you to have a paragraph, at least, that describes the game. Describes the game in terms of you know, when it was released, what platforms, what you have to do. You know, what, what as a player is, are you asked to do? Not necessarily that you have done it, but basically what is the game about. This is such a tempting exercise to write about either Red Dead Redemption 2 or Grand Theft Auto 5. Well, I can't do it. You, know, you could do Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah. I yeah. just don't know so many games, you know, so like... I was well, that's why it might be tough. Mm -hmm. This is an exercise which means you don't have to have ever played the game. Mm -hmm. Genuinely. You could write this about something you've never played. In, in fact, that might actually be beneficial. Although you, you're going to struggle to write about flow or anything like that in it, but you could look at just some of the. Some, if there's something like, Grand, you know, Red Dead Redemption Two, there's been so, so many controversies about that game. Treatment of women in it, casualization of violence, the huge scale of it. There's three themes. If you're going to write like six, seven hundred words on each of those, jobs, jobs are good. Then. You know, you could easily do something like that, and the game can kind of done. It does lend itself, I think, this exercise to doing games which are somewhat controversial because it gives you more to talk about in terms of that critical analysis stuff. But in that, you don't have to talk about, you know, I'd love somebody to do like Mortal Kombat or something like that because you, you guys wouldn't even thought of when this was controversial. But I can't think of a more controversial video game. It was relevant to me when I was a kid. For like 92, 93, they were genuinely talk about banning this fucking video game. You know, there was, there was campaigns in Parliament to get Mortal Kombat banned. And it's like, it's a cartoon dude. <laughs> it's not real. Like, if you're going to ban that, you're going to ban what, Tom Jerry? You know, itching scratchy. Um, so, you know, anything like that would lend itself to a, a really nice, decent analysis. So, I think there are two ways you can go about it. By all means, pick a game for this analysis which you have played and you know. Absolutely fine. As long as it's not the same one that you did for the first game. Absolutely fine, no problem with that. But if you want to take a slightly different approach, you can look at something which you're aware of, which has some cultural impact, but you know has themes which have been developed about that game in discussion, which are problematic. And there are, there are loads of games like that, you know. You do like fucking Mass Effect and how it treats, you know, LGBTQ players, you know, IA players. You know. Yeah. I think it's a good example, yeah, because you could do a whole section on paratextuality and adaption. Yeah. So it's like games that have political themes and aspects. Absolutely, because that fits with the sort of stuff I was talking about, ideology in games. Perfect. That would be a really strong... Um, and I think The Last of Us, is, you mean just to focus on The Last of Us for that? It's a really strong ideological message in The Last of Us. Yeah. Which is kind of weird in the context of today's lecture, actually, because... Some of the stuff that goes on in The Last of Us is kind of contrary to techno masculinity. Albeit, the production of that game is very techno masculine. You know? um, I think I read online that it seemed like it's about the IDF in Israel, the way that it's the most real in the season. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair to announce. Obviously, strengthen that out a bit, yeah. but you know, that would be it. Nobody did it last year, weirdly. I, I was expecting Last of Us, and it didn't happen, uh, which is kind of strange. Do we have a Fallout game? No, which would be ideal. I, was, I don't know why Fallout 4 came into my head. Yeah, that would work really well, I think, Fallout 4. I've never had a Fallout game for the video or for the bloody um, essay. I mean, it's only been one year, <laughs> you yeah. know, but they're ideal games for doing this kind of thing, I would argue. Um, other stuff that would be good. Somebody did a really, really good essay on FIFA last year. The reason why I haven't put it as one of the examples is I think it's a little bit too tempting to copy. 
uh, but it but it was and basically only kind of developed only one theme, which is how much of a bunch of shit bags EA are. So we played some stuff that they knew I wanted to hear, but it was a really well developed. There's a lot of good research about EA in it. You know? So non right, so we don't have to necessarily just be about the game. It could be about the development. No, that's an interesting or... thing. I know Jay is going to do, uh, and I'm giving him the leeway on this. He's not going to talk about a game. Mm. He's going to talk about game character. Right. So he's going to talk about Princess Peach. I knew it. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, but that means he can talk. I mean, by definition, she's in like 25 games. So I've said to him, you can't talk about all 25 games in this. This is two and a half thousand words, not a fucking PhD. So you know you're going to have to narrow it. But he's going to talk about like two or three different games over a period of time to see if there's any character development, spoiler alert if there isn't. Um, in that, yeah, you can talk, you know, if a game is part of a franchise, you can talk about the other games in the franchise, but focus on that game. Yeah. You can talk about the development of the game over time in that context then. What about the actual, like, developers? Oh yeah, absolutely, because oh, even with this last lecture, you have the context to talk about that. Yeah. Um, because, Developed, you were just saying about it earlier with Halo, developer and game become synonymous with one another. It's like the, the, game, the developer is ostensibly just an extension of the game at that point. Mm. You know? So yeah, that works for me as well. But it's a free hit. It, it, I mean, you can go with one or two ways of this. You can make this uh, you know, a passionate sort of appraisal of something you really love. Or you can go to town on something you really hate. I, I, I tried to plug this last year. Do something that you fucking that sucks. This is a critical review of something. If you think something blows, tell me why it blows. It's got to be easier to write it like that. Nobody took the bait. They all talked about stuff that they thought was really good. I was like, that's not how we do criticism. Criticism is about telling people they suck. Yeah, Nick, when you come for academic mentoring, right? That's criticism. You know, I'm telling you, you suck, and I'm telling you why. The important bit is I'm telling you why. Yeah. And that's why I want this essay to do. Tell me why. Yeah, there was too much of effusive praise of things last year. Damn it. No room for positivity in this world. Um, do you have any questions? So, like, with GTA, I just can't do GTA, even if it's another... You could do GTA 4. Oh, okay, so I can have... Yeah, you okay. could go backwards in time. I mean, it might be an idea that you have a little go at something. The problem with doing things like GTA 4 with that is how you manage to do it. It's not available on any new consoles. So, you know, you might need a little bit of familiarity. Yeah. You could do Pac-Man if you wanted to. I mean, that's, you know, that's gay. You could do a critical <laughs> review essay on it. You know? Because nobody did a nobody did a mobile game last year, which was weird. You know, I was, you know, when did somebody do fucking Candy Crush or something, you know? I'd like to do that. Like, Go for it. Like, that's I mean you could I certainly do it as well. It's, there is two and a half thousand words to be said. Yeah. You could do it. Somebody could do like fifteen hundred words just on flow with yeah. something like Candy Crush. Yeah. Because that shit is addictive. Yeah. You know, and it gets you in a massive flow state really quickly. Because um, GTA San Andreas on the, the computer, on the iPad, and there's like... Uh, that would be really system. interesting, especially as you've played GTA 5. Yeah. Going back to play San Andreas now, it, that's an experience. Yeah. Well, I remember in Spain I used to go to the coffee shops with a laptop to play San Andreas when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. And everyone was there playing San Andreas. Oh, everyone in the world was playing that game. That game was insanely popular. It's, they did the um, remasters, didn't they, a couple of years ago. They released GTA 3, San Andreas, and Vice City in a collection. And I thought about buying it. It was like, but one, it was 50 quid for three games which are 20 years old. I was like, nah, you're not going to laugh. And two, it was like, I really liked those games when I was like 23, 24 years old. And now I'm 44 years old. I don't think it's going to work, man. You know, I really like, you know, taking a shit ton of drugs and getting absolutely fucking shit faced all the time when I was that age. It's not going to work when I'm this age, you know. It's, it'd be interesting. 
if you pick up something which you bad analogy all that stuff right but if you pick up something that you played a long long time ago and played it again you might find that you didn't enjoy it quite as much as you used to very few games have that sort of length and weirdly the ones that have the worst reputation for being longevity like that is three dimensional games because the 3d back in the day was not good and now you play them and you think this is really dark and i can't see anything and nobody looks human and this is really really strange looking at what is going on and, you know why is all this stuff like this i want this to end i did have a go at vice city on the ps5 Ooh, sometime this year and it's like i played it for an hour and it's like nah this is shit <laughs> you know, this was this was good in 2004 this is shit good soundtrack oh my god i love that game so it's a free hit do whatever you like with it um, in terms of drafts and so on, same things apply. It's due in on the 9th of January. I'll read drafts up to the 8th, which is fine. Um, everyone did really well in this last year. Lowest mark was like 63. But I think out of the 15 people who did the module last year, 10 got a first for this. Um, and overall in the module last year, 12 out of 15 got first. So, no, it's, this module's easy. I marked the majority of assignment one, and they were all very, very good ones I marked. I haven't given anyone any more cool grade. It's excellent. Um, I haven't marked them all, because I've got BC ones to mark. I'll do that today. Um, I'm still waiting on a couple more people who've got BCs. I've had a really good week, Mark. Even the first year, well, no, quite a lot of first years suck. <laughs> They're fucking thick as shit sometimes. But I did I, I even did MS310 last night, and it was like, eh, people are good at this. I'm quite pleased. I'm quite happy with life. Hope you all are too. Right, should we call it quits? Should we finish? Go on. I'm not going home. Fucking meetings all day. Postgraduate students, god damn it. I can't even. Oh,